Hi, welcome back to Leadership and Teams. I'm Neil Fogarty, and today we're going to be taking a look at lecture number three, which is going to be talking about change, leading and change, managing and change. What do we got to do about change? You probably have heard some sayings about change. Uh, you know, some people say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, which basically says, don't change. And uh, I've heard other people say such things as, change is not required if survival isn't mandatory. So it seems like uh, whether you like change or not, it's going to be coming your way. So what we want to talk about is some ways to, to handle it. If you're the leader, what are you going to do? Are you going to lead your team through change or are you going to react to change? What are we going to do when all of a sudden change comes knocking at our door? So let's take a look at some of the topics that we're going to be looking at in this lecture. We're going to initially start off with uh, the, uh, the forces of change. There are a couple of different forces. Why change at all? What are the forces making us change. We're going to take a look at those. Then we're going to look at models of planned change. That's going to be the, the focal point of this uh, presentation today, this lecture today. Models of planned change. Instead of just to reacting to change, maybe what we ought to do is be proactive, and maybe what we ought to do is maybe we ought to lead that change and manage that change as we go through. We're also going to be taking a look at uh, resistance to change. Why do people resist change? And we'll probably also talk a little bit about uh, leadership styles and leadership modes during periods of change. So why don't we uh, go to our first topic today, and that's uh, forces of change. Regarding forces of change, there basically are two types of forces of change that most organizations have to face. In fact, I would imagine in some cases you could even say most individuals face. But again, we're going to be focusing on organizations and businesses. So two types of, of forces of change. The first force of change, the first type of force of change, are external forces of change, external. And the second type of force of change are internal forces of change, internal. So let's take a look at those because you're going to, as a leader of a business, as a manager of a business, you're going to be facing these, both the inside and the outside, the internal and the external. So let's take a look at some of the, some of the uh, uh, parts of them, some of the, the members, if you would, of them. With regard to the uh, internal forces of change, examples of internal forces, this comes from within the organization. Uh, your employees uh, want change. Uh, the way your employment is set up, you need change. All of a sudden, somebody who is a key employee is no longer with you. Who's going to handle that? And the employees also, on occasion, they'll come to you and say, hey, we, we don't like this. We need uh, better working conditions, whatever it might be. So employees certainly are uh, forces of change, internal forces of change. Another internal force of change that you have are the managers and uh, you know, the, the key executives in your organization. Oftentimes they're coming to you with great ideas. Let's do this. Let's not do this. Uh, you know, how, how can we become better? How can we move faster? And they'll come to you with ideas with regard to change. And they'll be forcing you in, in that sense to, to look at it. There'll be a force of change. And another internal source of change that you have uh, is, uh, you know, the resources that you have internally. And particularly right now, I'll focus on just one of them. But there are other resources that also may uh, force you into change. But how about money? As uh, your money situation changes, all of a sudden you might have forces of change. Let's say, for example, right now we're in this, this COVID uh, crisis right now. And a lot of businesses are finding that their cash flows have been plummeting. They're finding that their income has gone down, their revenues have gone down. Well, with the lower amount of cash coming into the business, and perhaps a lower amount of cash in, uh, in our reserves that we have, that's probably going to force us to change. We probably have to make different, uh, do different things with regard to the strategy that we had had, the tactics that we were using. So another of the internal forces of change are your res resources. And particularly at this point, I'm focusing on the, on the monetary, the financial resources. So those are internal forces of change. But what about the other type of force, external? The external forces of change include all sorts of things, such as what are your competitors doing? Certainly, if a competitor makes some changes, you might have to change. Whether you want to follow your competitor or go against your competitor, nonetheless, your competitor makes a move, you probably have to make a move. Another uh, external force of change that you might run into are your, your customers. All of a sudden, one day your customers like one thing, and the next day they like something else. 
that's the force of change. Are you going to stay the course or are you going to change because your customers want to change? Other examples, and including in that, of course, are the market changes that go with that. Other changes that you might, might find uh, going on outside are demographic changes. You know, for example, uh, we, I, I live uh, in the greater Pittsburgh area uh, in our county's uh, Allegheny County. And one of the things that we've seen over the years in Pittsburgh is we've seen that the uh, steel mills, which used to be king around here, have pretty much all closed. There's some, but not many. Uh, but if you take a look at the, the demographics here, when they closed and when businesses changed, we saw an awful lot of the young people move out, but a lot of the older people stayed. So the population of Allegheny County tends to be an older population than most counties. Well, that force of change has to be reckoned with. And think about it. If you have a more elderly population, that doesn't mean that you can't sell things. It just means that what you're selling, what you're making or whatever, has to fo form around what they desire. For example, health care. You might find that uh, you know, the elderly uh, spend more money and more time buying health care than they did, say, earlier in their lives when they're out there and they're buying cars or whatever. So certainly demographic changes are a source of change. And also there are other, other changes too, political changes, social changes. I mean, think about how uh, the millennials, when they came uh, into, uh, you know, graduate from college or whatever, think how they have changed the marketplace and how they've changed the workplace. So again, you, you have these other forces of change. There are, there are others as well, other external ones and other internal ones. But these are forces of change. And I want you to think about something too. A lot of those forces of change you have virtually no control over. For example, your competitors come up with a new product. What can you do? Pick up the phone and call them and tell them stop to do stop doing that? Of course not. The government comes in and all of a sudden there's a new regulation or something like that. Can you say, well, I'm not going to follow it? Well, you might. And we've seen quite a few businesses try to do that during these COVID days. But again, the problems that have arisen with regard to that, in most cases, you're not going to have much control over that or the lobbyists and things like that, but still, you don't have a great deal of control over that. And even internally, um, you know, when your employees, you know, get together and they want, uh, you know, massive change, oftentimes there's not a whole lot you can do to, uh, with regard to stopping that desire for change. You might be able to try to modify it or change the timing of it or whatever. But again, one of the problems that you're going to find is these forces of change oftentimes are outside your control. And because of that, now you have to make a decision. As a leader, am I going to have my whole organization change too, or are we going to stay the course and we're not going to change? Very big questions that arise all because of the forces of change. Okay, so let's take a look at the next major topic uh, with regard to change, and we're going to look at models of planned change. And there's a couple of different models that we're going to look at, and probably the, the best way to start is to start with what's called Lewin's change model. Lewin's change model, and Lewin is L-E-W-I-N, L-E-W-I-N, Lewin's change model. Lewin said, says that any time you have change, you really go through three stages, three stages. So there's three stages at least of plan change that you're going to have. And let's take a look at each of those stages. I'll tell you what they are, and I'll give you some ideas of some of the characteristics of them. And if indeed Lewin's right, and if you look at change as going through three stages, this will help you to plan how you're going to go through change, and what am I going to do at each of these stages. The first of Lewin's uh, stages uh, is called unfreezing. Unfreezing. Here, the focus is on creating a motivation to change, creating a motivation to change. Uh, and again, remember we're talking about motivation. It shouldn't be your motivation. It should be our motivation with regard to that. So one of the things you want to do is you want to make employees feel dissatisfied with the old way. Whatever it is you're currently doing, it's not working. We can do better. Our competition is going past us, you know, twice the speed of light, and we have to catch up. We have to change. So you want to make employees dissatisfied with the old way. If they're dissatisfied, then they'll want to change. That's one of the things you want to do, again, focusing on creating the need to change, the motivation to change. Now, once you do that, once you have them thinking that, well, the way we're doing it now isn't the right way and we should change. You want to get them thinking about ways to solve the problems, whatever the problem is that we have. Okay, this is the problem now. What should we do and how do we change to do it? 
So you want to get them to start thinking about the, the ways to solve the problem. And along that line, as, as they're starting to do that, you want to try to keep them from doing something that we as humans tend to want to do almost all the time. And that is you want to get them not to play the blame game, not to play the, the blame game. Because what you end up finding is, you know, whenever there's a problem, as opposed to trying to figure out how to solve it, people initially like to blame people or blame things or blame ideas, blame institutions or whatever. And the problem with the blame game is it doesn't matter who is at fault. What matters is what's the solution. But if you play the blame game, you're, you're, you're kind of looking in the rearview mirror as you're driving along. And I think it was uh, Coach Bill Cower of the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, you know, a number of years ago, probably 10, 15 years ago, said that he was not a rear view person type of guy. That meant that, of course, he'll look in a rear view mirror as he's driving just to see who's, who's where or whatever. But for the most part, he has his eyes looking forward to see what we're going to do, the changes coming ahead. Let's not look in the past to blame things. Let's look in the forward, forward in the future to see what we want to do to make things better with regard to it. Now, related to this, another thing that Lewin says with regard to the unfreezing stage is this is probably a pretty good time to start using benchmarking. Benchmarking. Benchmarking is where you compare yourself to others. So one of the things you can do is you compare your company to others. Oh, you know, look at the other companies that are in this, this market. Look at what they're doing, etc. Are we doing better? Are they doing better? If so, what are they doing differently, etc.? You want to benchmark. But another thing you can do is you can also start benchmarking yourself and your employees with regard to as they start to go through the various changes, see where things are. And along that line as you benchmark, and particularly when you're looking at your competitors, but even maybe with regard to your employees, you, you, you want to learn how the best performers are doing what they're doing. How are they making this change work? Because if you follow what the best performers are doing, that can teach you a lot. You don't have to copy them word for word or be in lockstep with them. But if you see what they're doing to find success, they're doing to find a way to be a best performer, then maybe you want to think about doing that too as you're going through this, this process of change. One other thing, too, that, that Lewin talks about at this point is he says that you should recognize as a manager, as a leader of an organization, one of the big problems you could run into is you may have within your own organization, within the structure and the processes, etc., you may have barriers to change, things to tell people, hey, you know, I want to change, go this way, but you might have barriers to slow them down. And one of the things you want to do is you want to reduce those barriers to change. There's a, uh, there's a rule that we'll talk about a little bit later uh, in here called the 85-15 rule. And it talks about uh, barriers to change and how managers uh, get involved uh, with that. So still staying with Lewin, that was the first stage. That was the uh, unfreezing stage. Let's go to the next stage that we have. And the next stage is called the changing stage, the changing we unfroze them. This is the way we did it, so we want to unfreeze them so that they're ready to, to change. Then the next stage is the changing stage. So they were, they were here, they were frozen here, and now what we want to do is we want to unfreeze them, and now we're going to start to go through the changing stage here as we start moving towards where we want to go. With regard to the changing stage, Lewin also has a couple of things to say. He says at this point in, during changing stage as a manager, as a leader, one of the things that you really want to do is you want to help your employees to learn, help them to learn. Uh, one, one, of the, one of the biggest barriers to uh, learning and to changing, one of the biggest reasons for resistance, which we'll talk about later, is fear of the unknown. So one of the things you can do now is you can try to teach them and train them uh, what the unknown's about, how to do it, where we're going, things of that nature. So you want to help your employees to learn. Uh, in this light, as you start to help them to learn, you want to give them some new information. They, they don't know what, what we're doing or where we're going, so give them some new information. You might want to give them some new behavior models. Hey, listen, people who go through this change, this is what they've done, the ones who did it successfully. These are some of the things that we probably want to emulate, these behavior models we want to find out, look at. And then you also want to try to encourage your, uh, your employees to adopt new ways of looking at things. Don't look through the same old pair of glasses. Let's change the glasses we have. 
let's put on something that we're, where all of a sudden now everything's a little clearer, a little bit more in focus. We want to find a new way to, uh, to look at things. Now, Lewin still, in talking about this concept of uh, the changing stage, has uh, a couple of suggestions for you to help you to facilitate the change, to help make this change work a little bit better for you. So let's take a look at some of his, his tools that he has for you, some of the suggestions that he has. First suggestion he has is to use role models. Use role models. It could be other companies, it could be various employees, it could be people in general who are role models to help with regard to this concept of change. They would probably have already gone through it, they know what's going to happen, they're really pretty good at showing people how do we act as we go through this, this period of change. Related to that, you probably want to have some mentors around, people who indeed have gone through it, who can answer the questions, oh, this is how you're going to do it, and hey, around the next corner, this is something you might want to be concerned about and look for. You want to have mentors. Along this line, another suggestion, another tool, but one you want to be a little careful about is to use consultants. And particularly, you want to be careful about using outside consultants. And the reason that Lewin says this, and, and I agree with him, outside consultants can be absolutely brilliant. You could go to some of the you know, large accounting firms that are multinational accounting firms, and you'll find they have some of the best consulting teams in, in the world on those. And the, there's other consulting groups, too. I just want to focus on these uh, large uh, accounting firms. So you go to you know, their strategic consulting group or whatever in, uh, say, a PricewaterhouseCooper, and you might find that they have absolute brilliant people get along well, they communicate well and everything. But here's the problem you have. When you bring an outsider into your organization, no matter how brilliant that person is, that person's still an outsider. So when that person comes in and starts to tell the employees, oh, you know what, you're, what you're doing is awful, and we have to change it to this way or the other, your employees are likely to look at, what do you mean? How do you know? You've been here for, what, a week, two weeks, or whatever? I've been here for 20 years. How can you tell me what's going on here? You don't know. I do. So one of the problems you have is that when you have outsiders trying to lead change or tell people to change, oftentimes there's some resistance because, again, they're they're outsiders, and the insiders are saying, hey, you, you don't know anything about what I'm going through. Some other suggestions that, uh, that Lewin has here for facilitating this change to keep it going is he, he suggests that you should benchmark your results. As you're, as you're going through this change and as you're moving people along, benchmark it. How long did it take you to go from point one to point two? And what problems did you see? What can we do to fix it so that we go from point two to point three, maybe go a little bit faster? So you want to benchmark it as we go through. Uh, and again, learn from the benchmarking. And another suggestion, a really good suggestion here with regard to helping to facilitate the change is you want to use lots of training, lots of training and, and good training, something that helps people do things. I want to think about this. You know, you, all of a sudden you, you sit down behind a computer and you've, you've been using, you know, one type of software uh, most of the time. Uh, let, let's say that, you know, you're a, uh, you're a PC user and all of a sudden now someone wants you to use a Mac. Or you're a Mac user and somebody wants you to use a PC. There's a lot of things that they do exactly the same way, but sometimes they do it differently. Instead of pushing this key, you push that key. Instead of doing one, two, three, you do three, two, one but they still get you to the same place. So one of the things that you really could help your employees with is to train them because they know how to do it one way. Now someone has to tell them, has to train them how to do it another way. Training can certainly help with regard to uh, change. The final thing that Lewin says with regard to the changing stage, which is also pretty important, is you really want to inform your employees that change is a continuous process a continuous process and not a one-time thing. What tends to happen a lot with employees who go through a period of change, you know, it's, 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 it's awful going through change at times. It's very hard, it's trying, it's stressful, it takes a lot of time, perhaps a lot of money. Uh, and, the, and the employees, as I say, uh, you know, they're the, they're the ones who oftentimes feel the brunt of it. So as they're going through this and they finally get to, oh my gosh, we're almost done with the change, this is great, Finally, we can sit back on our laurels and take a breath and go back to, you know, normalcy, so to speak. And then, of course, what do you do? 
almost immediately after you make one change, there's another change, and there's another change, and there's another change. Life is continuously changing, and you have to continuously change too. If your employees think, oh, that's it, one time and I'm done, after they get through the one change, they want to sit down and they don't want to change again. And then when you try to encourage them to change again, oh my gosh, no, wait a minute, I already did that. I'm not going to do it again. So one of the things that's probably a good idea as you're talking to them through this period of change is tell them, hey, listen, you know, keep in mind, this is, this is going to go on and on and on. We'll finally change here, absolutely. We're going to get this done and we're going to do it successfully. But you know what? After that, there's going to be other changes too. I think there's, a, there's an old, old saying that the chief cause of problems is solutions. You solve one problem with a great solution and you end up creating a whole bunch of other problems you didn't even know were there, i.e., you go through one change and you fix it, you solve it. Now all of a sudden I got a whole bunch of other changes I got to go through. You want your employees to know that. Well, let's go to the third and the final stage on the little one, and it's called the refreezing stage. The refreezing stage. We had the unfreezing stage, we had the changing stage, and now we want to have the refreezing stage. The refreezing stage, a couple of the characteristics that Lewin talks about. At this point, the change is stabilized. Whew. It's over, or mainly over. The change is stabilized. It's integrated this into, into the normal way of doing things. The new way is now the normal way. The new way is now the normal way. Just a little bit ago, my, my wife was on the phone talking to one of her colleagues at work, and uh, the, this colleague was, was talking about how things used to be, and you know, da-da-da-da-da. And that's fine, that's fine. But you have to recognize, once I go through a period of change, the new way is now the normal way. The old way, thanks, we had it, it was great, we learned from it, but we've moved on. The new way is now the normal way. A couple of other suggestions that he has, how do you, how do, you do this, how do you stabilize it, make the new way the, uh, the normal way. Uh, one thing he suggests is that you make sure that you have your employees do things the new way. Don't let them slip back. Don't let them go back to the old way of doing things. If you do that, and there's always a temptation to do that, right? I'm in a new spot. I just want to go back to the way I always did things. It worked that way. If you allow your employees to regress and go back to the old way, now not only do I have to encourage them and get them back to the, the new way of doing things, but it might even be harder because they just went back to the old way and they felt so much more secure and comfortable, etc. They don't want to leave. So now they might even have even greater resistance to change. So one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that you have your employees continue to do it the new way. Monitor with regard to that. You know, watch their behaviors, watch your attitude, etc. The new way should be the normal way. Along that lines, you want to positively reinforce people acting the new way, the new normal, so to speak. How can you do this? Well, you know, lots of coaching with regard to this, lots of modeling that you have, rewards and incentives, you know, the, the first person who, you know, does it the new way, here we go, etc. with regard to it. Let me give you an example of something that uh, we went through uh, in one of my coaching uh, uh, situations. I mentioned that earlier that I coach a lot of uh, youth baseball. Lo I absolutely love baseball. My kids played it. And I love working with kids. So I was a coach and manager of this youth baseball team. And we had, uh, and one, one of the teams I had, we, we had this uh, fellow, he's probably around nine or ten years old, and uh, his, uh, uh, his, his dad had not been a baseball player, uh, but, you know, his dad loved baseball, and so did he, and honestly, I, I don't know too much about his mom, but his, his dad was at most games and most practices and everything, but as I said, his dad really didn't know that much about baseball, I don't think his dad had ever played, maybe, you know, in gym or something like that, but I don't think his dad had ever played, and one of the things that this, this young man did is he when he'd come up to bat, he would constantly spin his bat. It was constantly, I, I call it twirling spaghetti here with his bat. Now, one of the problems you have in doing that and trying to teach somebody how to bat what to do is you, of course, have to have a place where you're going to start. Where are we going to start the swing? Well, if you're twirling your spaghetti, every time you start to swing, it's at a different spot than a twirl, right? So it's very difficult to have a standard start spot. So we were trying to teach this young man some things about batting because he wasn't batting very well. He was actually batting pretty poorly. And we, we recognized that he was pretty athletic and there were probably some things that we could do. And one of the things we want to do is stop this twirling spaghetti. And it didn't help that he was a real fan 
of there was a, at the time, I think, a catcher, I believe it was, for the Pittsburgh Pirates who twirled his bat. Well, you know, when you get to be the pros, you know how to hit the ball, you know what to do, and one of the things that the kid didn't see is this guy would twirl the bat until the pitcher was just ready to pitch, at which time the guy would stop and lock his bat in place, and he always started to swing pretty much at the same spot. This young man didn't see that. So we had to tell him, no more twirling the bat. And we'd hold the bat, you know, as he'd get there to swing, etc. And, oh, he, he didn't like that at all. And, you know, his dad was wondering what, are, what were we doing, etc. with regard to it. But we went through these stages. First, we had the unfreezing stage. Oh, I don't want to change. This is the way Dad taught me, and I've been batting this way, you know, for the last uh, two or three years as a kid. Not hitting the ball, but this is the way I've been batting. It, you know, notice he said this is the way we're batting, not the way I'm hitting, because, well, he wasn't hitting. So one of the things we had to do is we had to show him, you know, listen, look at you compared to the others. You know, how do you think that you back him? Well, he recognized that he wasn't getting hits. I mean, we didn't have to put him down. We didn't. He recognized off the, off, off the uh, uh, start of the plate here, I'm, I'm not getting hits. And we said, okay, well, listen, let's take a look at some of these, these other kids who are, are hitting the ball. And we recognized that most of them weren't doing this. Most of them would come up to the plate and they'd lock their hands before they, they would go to swing. Everything started at the same spot. So we used that and said, listen, your way isn't working. Their way is. Our way is. Why don't you give it a try? So we got him unfrozen, even with some problems with his dad and trying to get him unfrozen in that. But then as we went through the changing stage with regard to this, you know, he occasionally kept wanting to go back to this or whatever, and it took him a while. Even just holding the bat, took him a while before he started to connect, etc. But he started to connect, and he started to get hits, and he started getting some, some pretty big hits, etc. So now this changing stage is going pretty good. We're now in, into the refreezing stage. Okay, recognize this. We're going to start at the same spot. We're not going to twirl the bat or whatever. And this was the new normal for him, the new normal. But we didn't want him to go back. Let's say he got into a slump. And all of a sudden, we go to a couple of games, and this young man, really great kid, all of a sudden wasn't hitting the ball. You know what the temptation is? Well, I'm going to go back to the way I used to hit. No, don't. Stay this way. We'll get you through this. And eventually eventually we did. It was through coaching, etc. And one of the things I'll mention here, and it goes back to this concept of rewards and incentives, etc. The other, the other boys on the team, the other 9-year-old or 10-year-olds that we had, they recognized that this fellow had some, some trouble. They also recognized he's really talented in so many ways he just couldn't hit. When he started to get to the point where he was doing what we were told, and all of a sudden he started getting hits, you should have seen how the team would rally around him. They're jumping up and down, oh, this is a great hit, etc. So they really helped, too. So they gave him a lot of incentives. I mean, we did, but the, the team itself, the other kids did as well. So that finishes up Lewin. Lewin has some great thoughts here with regard to change. You have the unfreezing stage, you have the changing stage, you have the uh, uh, refreezing stage. And he gives you some ideas of what's going to happen during those stages and one of the, some of the things that you can do to help it. So I think Lewin's, Lewin's model, it's fairly simple, is very usable for you in your career ahead. But let's now go on to another model that we have here. And the next model I want to talk about is called the systems model of change. Okay, let's now take a look at the next model, which is a systems model of change. Now, we're all going to look at it briefly in lecture. You should take a little bit more time as you go over it in the textbook and the notes that I have on, uh, on Canvas for you. By the way, one of the things I'll, I'll mention to you uh, our, everything we have is on Canvas, and uh, at times you might hear me use a different buzzword instead of saying it's on Canvas. I might say it's on CourseWeb. If I do, I apologize. Uh, at Pitt, we didn't use Canvas. We used Blackboard, and the system itself called our website CourseWeb. So after doing that for thir some 33 years, it's hard to get rid of it. I will try to keep and say Canvas, but should you hear me say, look at CourseWeb, I'm talking about Canvas. Well, let's take a look at the systems model of change. A couple of points, as I said, I'm just going to look at it uh, fairly briefly. This takes a big picture perspective of change, a big picture perspective of change. Uh, it looks at change as kind of a cascading event. Uh, maybe a better way of saying it is uh, you, you've heard of the old uh, analogy, you throw a pe pebble into a pond and you have that ripple effect that goes out. Well, when you have change in an organization, you might throw the change, might be a pebble in the pond, 
but there's other things that are going to be impacted. So it's not just the area you target for change, but there's going to be a much broader uh, change. The perspective here should be not just focusing on the area of change, but trying to recognize what some of the other changes might be, the subsequent changes, those ripples, how far out are they going to go. Uh, with, with regard to this too, uh, what you want to keep in mind is that there are three components of the systems model of change, three components. And let me first tell you what they are, and then I'll talk a little bit about each one. The three components, you have inputs, you have the targeted elements of change, and you have the outputs. The inputs of the change, they're oftentimes the forces of change. Why did you change? Why did, you know, what caused this to change? Uh, you know, and oftentimes you might even look at the strategy you have, the tactics you have. They might have also caused you to change. So, you know, what were the inputs causing the change? And, you know, we also mentioned that we try to make people dissatisfied with the current way things are. Well, what dissatisfies you with the current way things are? So, you know, what are the inputs? What, what's trying to ignite you to, uh, to change? The targeted elements of change is once you figured out, okay, these are the problem areas, I'm going to target this, and I'm going to target that to change. Those are the areas that you're going to focus your, your change efforts on. The, the three stages of Lewin, and we're going to talk about some other uh, uh, people's models as well. Those are where you're going to target these, these efforts, etc. And then lastly are the outputs. Okay, I've targeted the, the, uh, you know, this and I've targeted that. But even though I've just targeted these, these, these two that we have here, one of the problems is other things are going to be impacted. I might want to change, for example, uh, there's somebody in your household, and I might want to change that person's behavior. But by changing that person's behavior in your, in, in your household, all of a sudden now I'm changing the, the behavior of a whole bunch of people in your, in your household because they have to put up with this, this change, this new person. So the, the outputs oftentimes are much broader, and sometimes unexpected. So one of the things that this change model is saying, the systems model is saying, look more broadly. Don't just look at the targeted element. Look at what other things are going to change too. Who else is going to be impacted? What other parts of my organization are going to be impacted? So now what we're going to do, that finishes up the second model plan change I want to talk about, uh, the systems model. And now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the third model I want to talk about, and it's called Cotter's Eight Steps for Organizational Change. Cotter's Eight Steps for Organizational Change. Okay, let's now take a look at uh, Cotter's Eight Steps for Leading Organizational Change. This is the third change model that we're going to take a look at, Cotter's Eight Steps. And just a couple of thoughts for you. Cotter saw what uh, Lewin had put together and thought it was pretty, pretty, pretty good and said, you know, I, I, can, I can make this even better and Cotter tweaked it, and Cotter basically took Lewin's three stages, and Cotter turned it into eight steps. You know, a good example of how people in life try to try to take easy things and make them hard, but it's not necessarily that. There's some good points that Carter, uh, Cotter comes up here. Cotter, by the way, is K-O-T-T-E-R, K-O-T-T-E-R. So let's take a look at his, uh, his eight steps of, of, of organizational change. And one of the things I would suggest to you as we go through this is see if you can see where any of his steps line up with any of Lewin's stages. You'll probably see that each one of Cotter's steps does indeed fit into one of Lewin's stages. I'd like you to think of which step fits into which stage. So let's take a look here with regard to uh, the steps. And by the way, you know, Co Cotter says these are sequential uh, you know, I, I think there's probably a little bit of uh, debate there, but these these are eight eight good steps. So first, you want to establish a sense of urgency. Establish a sense of urgency. You want to give a reason for changing. Oh my gosh, if we don't do this, we're going to lose a customer. If we don't do this, you're going to get laid off, or things of that. So you want to establish a sense of urgency. You also then, after you got the people thinking, yeah, maybe we ought to change. Oh my goodness, look at what's happening here. Then what you want to do is you want to create a guiding coalition, a guiding coalition. 
Who's going to be on the team of change? Who are going to who who are going to be the guides for it? You know, the the leaders of it. Who's going to be in the team itself with regard to it? We want to put together this guiding coalition to kind of help point everybody in the right direction. Next, what you want to do, and probably great inputs would be coming from others, but this is also going to be something that the guy in coalition is going to do, is you want to develop a vision and strategy, a vision and strategy. Listen, I know where we are today. My vision is we can fix this, and this is what things are going to look like if we do. What's your vision? And now that we have a vision, this is what we want to do. Give me the strategy. How are we going to get there? What are the stages to get there that we're going to have? So you want to develop a vision and strategy. The fourth of Cotter's steps, you now want to communicate that vision of change. Communicate it. Let your employees, let everybody in the organization know. Uh, when we get to resistance, which will be coming up fairly soon, one of the reasons people resist is, again, that fear of the unknown. Well, if you can communicate your vision with regard to this, as well as communicate to them your strategy, your plan, how are we going to get there, this helps to reduce a little bit of that fear of the unknown. There's always something that's unexpected that's going to happen, but at least here we can kind of reduce that a little bit and therefore hopefully reduce resistance as well. Well, those are the first four steps. Let's take a look at the second four. The fifth step is now you want to empower broad-based action. Empower broad-based action. You want to delegate authority to various members of the team, etc. You want to engage in participative management. You're going to you know, participate and watch, but you're going to let them manage as well. So you're going to have this delegation, participative management, and whatever. And something else you should keep in mind, this kind of goes back to something that we talked about a little bit in motivation. If you really want to get people motivated, you want to get them involved. You want to get them engaged. If, again, is it your idea or is it my idea? Is it your plan or is it my plan? Is it your action or is it my action? If you get them engaged, if they take some ownership in it, the odds are they're going to be a little bit more motivated here. So again, you want to empower broad-based action. You want to get everybody involved. What are we going to do? The next step, the, the sixth step that we have, is you want to generate short-term wins. Generate short-term wins. You don't have to wait till you're all the way at the end of this to, to figure out, oh, I'm going to pat somebody on the back. Step-by-step step, as you go through is probably as good a time as any to also pat people on the back, the short-term wins. Let me again go back to that, uh, that boy on the baseball team, the nine-year-old or whatever. One of the things that we started to do with him is he, as, as, as he got to the point where he stopped this and went more to a you know, lock and load type of thing, um, even if he didn't hit the ball, as coaches, you know, we were praising him great you know, as a tough at bat. You know, the, the, the pitcher was, it was, was amazing and that umpire is crazy. What's wrong? But you, you, you know, it's great. You did exactly what we want. We're, you know, don't worry about the fact you didn't connect or whatever. We're going to get that going, etc. Generate short-term wins because those short-term wins help to encourage people to go from here to there, right? So and you got to keep doing that every step of the way. So the next thing is generate short-term wins. The seventh step that he has is you want to now, after, after we've gotten to the point now, uh, we're moving along and we're, we're making some, some progress, you want to consolidate your gains to help produce more, more change. Okay, with regard to this kid, you got your first hit. That's great. That's great. Now let's get you up here. We're going to get you a couple more hits. We're going to, you know, a double or something out of this. We want to take what we've learned. We want to consolidate that knowledge, consolidate the attitude, the power, whatever that we have, and we want to use that then to help produce more change and so we can continue along this path that we go on. And then finally, once we get there, once we have done what we wanted to accomplish, once we've made that achievement, we've reached the goal, etc., now you want to anchor the new approaches into the culture. The new way is now going to be the normal way. You want to anchor the new way into the culture that we have. Now, again, as I said, if think about it. We just went through those, those eight steps. And you can see they are pretty much chronological, as he's saying, but I, I'm not so sure that some of them, might, there might not be some, some room for juxtap uh, juxtaposing them a little bit. But overall, if you take a look at these, some pretty good things that he came up with. And he took what Cotter said, which I thought, uh, I'm sorry, he took what Lewin said, and which was really good. And I think he's, he's added it. Uh, you know, maybe what he did is he took some of the stages and he broke them down or whatever, but I think he's added some, some uh, beneficial points here for, for your consideration as you go through. Now, there's something else, too, that, that Cotter says in addition to these, these eight steps. And it's related to something I alluded to when we were talking about Lewin. Let me first talk about that thing I alluded to when we talked about Lewin and then go to what Cotter said. 
I'm, when we're talking about Lewin, I said there was something called the 85-15 rule. And I said I was going to come back to it. And by the way, to, the way to write that is you just write, you know, 80, uh, you know, 85 dot dot and 15. It's kind of like, you know, 4.15 in the afternoon, but instead it's going to be 85.15 in the afternoon. The 85-15 rule. Let me tell you what that is. This is something that, uh, that Lewin was, was suggesting on others as well. Lewin, when he was talking about barriers to change, Lewin was saying it amazed him how often when he was studying change in organizations and how often when he found an organization that had failed. And frankly, most organizations fail as they go through change. Not all the time, but change is so difficult to manage and to lead. There are a lot of failures. So he was looking at the failures and said, you know what, most of the time there's a failure. The management or the leaders want to blame the employees, but oftentimes the reason for the failure is the management and the leaders themselves. In fact, he said 85% of the time the failure is due to management and leadership, and only 15% is it due to the employees, to the, to the team members, so to speak. I'm not so sure that I agree with the full perspective of that, the, you know, that it's 85% of the time. But clearly an awful lot of the time, when an organization is going into change and fails, it's not the problem, not, not the cause of the employees. Oftentimes the cause is poor management or poor leadership. Well, related to that now, Cotter looks at this, and Cotter says that successful change, successful change is 70 to 90 percent leadership and only 10 to 30 percent management. Successful change is 70 to 90 percent leadership and only 10 to 30 percent management. And then he says, as a consequence, you want to focus on leading and not necessarily managing. You want to focus on leading, not necessarily managing. Well, let's take a look at that again. Here we are, we're talking about this leadership course. And one of the things I mentioned in an earlier video is, is there a difference between leading and managing? And if so, what's the difference? And what would you have if you had an organization that had good managers and poor leaders? or another organization is good leaders but poor managers. Well, here what he's talking about is he's saying there's a difference between leading and managing, and oftentimes what you're going to find, a really successful uh, attempt to change will oftentimes be due to leading and not managing. Now, I'm not saying that you don't need managers. You absolutely do. And when he says, you know, it's, it's you know, 70-30 or 90-10 or whatever, it seems to say that managers, you know, aren't really necessary. They are. Managers are the ones that get the things moving in place, and it's the leaders who tell you where we're going and how we're going to get there. Managers are absolutely critical. But if the people at the top, if the leaders don't lead, if they don't do a good job, you're not going to find success. And that's very similar to what we saw with regard to Lewin in this 85-15 rule that we had. Now, one of the other things I want to mention, the, uh, if, if you've taken a look at the notes and taken a look at the book, the next uh, model that we have is called organizational development, organizational development, or OD. And it's a really important model, but I'm not going to cover it in lecture. What I want you to do is I'd like you to take a look at some of the notes that I have online. I'd like you to take a look at the PowerPoints that are online from the, from the textbook. And I'd like you to read in the, in the chapters you know, what it talks about with regard to OD. But I'm not going to cover it in lecture. Not because I'm demeaning it, it's just that we only have so much time, and I'd rather focus it on some other areas. Organizational development, really important. You should take a look at it. As I say, we're not going to cover it in our lecture. So the next thing that I'm going to do with regard to lecture is we're going to move on to this concept of resistance. Why do people resist change? Why will your employees resist change? Why will those who you're trying to get change going on in your family and your friends, why is there resistance? So we're going to take a look at resistance in our, in our next, uh, next segment. Okay, let's go to our next topic here in, uh, in change, managing and leading change. And the next is understanding and managing resistance to change. Resistance to change, big topic here, very important. Anytime you have change, there's going, there's going to be some sort of resistance. So let's take a look at the first topic that we have, uh, the first main topic under uh, resistance. Why people resist change in the workplace? Why do people resist change in the workplace? Now, before I get to the reasons, let's, let's start off with uh, at least two subpoints. Let's define what does resistance to change mean, and then let's take a look at types 
of resistance to change, types of resistance. Then we'll do is go and look at examples of resistance. But let's start off with the definition of resistance to change. Your textbook says this is an emotional behavioral response, an emotional or behavioral response to real or imagined threats to an established work routine. This is an emotional behavioral response to real or imagined threats to an established work routine. Notice something that says there, to real or imagined. Uh, oftentimes, a lot of people are afraid of change, and it's not because the real realities of the change are scary. It's because their imagination of the change and how you're going to get there, what it's going to be like, etc. It's the imagination that's scary. So what you end up finding is oftentimes when you're managing re uh, resistance to change, you're not always just dealing with reality. You're, you're dealing with someone's imagined uh, threats to change. Now let's take a look at the next of those topics I mentioned before we get to some examples of it. Some types of change. Some types of change. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, put up a, a, a graphic uh, uh, showing four different types of change based on two different parameters. So let me put up that graphic right now. Okay, now that you've taken a look at that graphic, let's talk a little bit about it. Basically what we're saying is that with regard to types of change, there are four types. You have some people who are active and subtle in their resistance to change. They're active. They do things to, to sabotage the change, but they do it subtly. They, they don't tell you. They don't let you know that they're against the change. In fact, that oftentimes they may say, oh, yeah, I'm fine with this, etc. But behind your back, they're subtly trying to sabotage the change, so to speak. So that's one type. Another type that you have is someone who is actively against the change, but they're also overtly against it. They tell you, I think this is the craziest idea I've ever heard. I'm going to do everything I can to stop this. I think this, this is nuts. So that's another type of uh, resistance. Let's go to the next. The next is someone who is passive and subtle. They don't tell you that they don't like the change, but they don't really do anything about it either. I hate to change it, but, you know, what am I going to do? So they, they, they don't do anything actively to stop the change. They're pretty passive. They don't tell you. Uh, maybe they're afraid if you know they don't like the change, it's going to hurt their career, or you're going to get mad or something like that. So they kind of hold it inside. Uh, and that's, that's the third type of uh, resistance to change. The fourth and the final type of resistance to change is someone who's passive about it. They're not going to actively try to stop you. But they are overt. They tell you, this is nuts. I, I, I'm really concerned about this change. I don't think we should do it. That might be the best type to have because those people aren't trying to stop you, but they are letting you know about their concerns. Maybe they do have something uh, that you want to consider that might help you as you're thinking, should I go ahead with this change or not? So this is of the different types of resistance. This is probably the best. The worst is probably the first one I gave you. The person who doesn't tell you they're against the change and then subtly, when you're not looking, does things to, to sabotage it. That's probably the worst that you have. So those are the types of change. So now let's move on to uh, reasons, uh, not the types of change, those are the types of resistance. Now let's go on to reasons for resistance, examples of why people might, might resist. And I have a list here, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, let's see, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Looks like eleven, and there's probably some additional parts within it that we have. So there's a lot of reasons why people resist change. And you as a manager or leader are probably going to run into, well, frankly, all of these and maybe some others as well. Let's take a look at the, uh, the first reason to resist change. In fact, if you were in a class, if we were actually in a class right now, I'd be asking everybody, hey, what are the reasons people resist change? You know, what do you think? And what do you think, etc.? And you probably should be thinking about that too. Don't wait for my list. Think about your list. 
Why do people resist change? But let's take a look at the list, my list, the books list that we have. The, the first reason that people resist change are an individual's predisposition to change. An individual's predisposition to change. You know, some people are just suspicious and distrustful. It doesn't matter if they're, they're, they're sitting on, you know, uh, you know, Santa Claus's lap or whatever. You know, they, they just, they don't trust anybody. So if you come along and say, hey, we want to change, well, they don't want to change because they don't trust you. They're suspicious about everything. Whereas other people, their predisposition, they're flexible, they're open, they're receptive, they're patient, they're understanding. So those two different things are going to change. So if you have somebody who's distrustful and suspicious about virtually everything, well, that person's going to be uh, suspicious and distrustful with regard to change. Let's go to the second reason why uh, individuals uh, resist change. Surprise and the fear of the unknown. Surprise and fear of the unknown. I actually think your textbook should make these two separate ones, but it has it down as one. First, let's talk about surprise. Think about this. How often have things happened to you that just because they came along and they were unexpected and they surprised you, even if it was a good change, you initially were pretty leery. It's like, oh my gosh, you know, hold on. Let me, let me see what's going on. So surprise is certainly a reason why people resist change. You know, if, if change is coming down the road, you should kind of give your employees an indication. Hey, you know what? This, there's some things that are happening here. You know, get ready. We, we might be going through some change. There have been a lot of businesses who, who didn't. And, you know, the top people, they, they sold the company and they didn't tell anybody else. And next thing you know, the people read it in the newspaper or something like that. So, oh my gosh, what are we doing? So you want to be careful with regard to surprise. That certainly can lead to resistance to change. And also this concept of the fear of the unknown. That, that's, that's immense. That's huge. Most of us have a fear of the unknown. Oh, I mean, there are people who are pioneers and they want to go, you know, like in that Star Trek, uh, it used to say at the very beginning, and sadly it's not gender neutral, but, you know, uh, I think it was William Shatner who was Captain Kirk, going where no man has gone before. Oh, okay, great, that's great for, you know, Star Trek uh, TV show or whatever. And there are a lot of people who are indeed pioneers, but many, many people are afraid of the unknown. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, what, what's underneath my bed, you know, when you're a kid, you know, is there a monster in the closet, that type of thing, the fear of the unknown. Let's go to the next reason for uh, this uh, uh, resistance to change that you'll have. The next is there's a climate of mistrust in your business. There's a climate of mistrust. There's a culture of mistrust. There's no reciprocal faith. Nobody believes anybody. Everybody's lying. Either, you know, they're backstabbers or whatever. Certainly in, a, in an organization like that, people are going to resist change because I don't trust you. You know, I mean, look at what you did to me last week and look at what you did to Tom the week before and Sally the week before that. So if you have a climate of mistrust, a culture of mistrust, that also is just on its own going to generate a resistance to change. The next reason why people resist change, and this is a pretty good one too, fear of failure. Fear of failure. And it, it can be basically two different types of fear of failure. Uh, the one is you're intimidated by the change. I don't know where we're going. And I don't know if I can do what needs to be done to get us there. Oh, I've got to learn something new. I've got to change something the way I'm doing it. I've got to do this, that, and the other. I don't know if I can do it. So there's a, that type of intimidation of the change. Also related to that uh, is, is self-doubt. <sighs> yeah, I, I, I know how to do it. I, I, I don't think I can. I don't think I can. And if somebody has self-doubt, they also will probably resist change, or at least they'll be more inclined to resist change. Let's go to the next uh, reason why people resist change. A loss of status and our job security. Loss of status and our job security. And again, this could probably be two separate reasons. You're going through change in an organization where your organization is going to merge with another one. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid about this because once we do, their organization has all the same type of positions that my organization does. So there's somebody in their organization that does what I do. So who's going to get, we only need one. Who's going to get the job, that person or me? So you, you have this, 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 fear that you're going to lose your job. And uh, quite a few people have lost their job because of change in organizations. So, you know, it's, it's not necessarily unfounded. Also, this, this, this concept of, uh, uh, you know, related to loss of status. 
okay, one day, you know, I'm the, I'm the chief chef here of whatever business it is, and then we merge with another company, and there's a chief chef over there. The next thing you know, I've got to report to that person. What? I used to be my own boss. Now i got to report to somebody else? So now we have this loss of status, and that also can really impact people with regard to their career and whether or not they want to go through this change. Who wants to lose status? You probably worked hard to get whatever status you currently have. Let's go to the next reason for this resistance to change. Peer pressure. Peer pressure. Sometimes you just go along to get along. You, you know, the whole group doesn't want to change. You don't really care if you change or not, but if the group of employees you're in don't want to change, well, why not join them? You know, peer pressure is telling me to, and I don't want to stand on the outside, I want to be part of something. Uh, and sometimes with regard to this, this peer pressure, it's not so much you, but somebody else that you're concerned about. Maybe there's a change going on that's going to impact your organization. You're, you're part of the organization really, really well. But again, that pebble and the, the ripples, etc., going out, maybe the change that's going to help you is going to hurt your best friend who's in another department. So there's peer pressure, and it's not so much that other person telling you we shouldn't do it. It's your concern for that other person going to lose her job or have some very negative consequence associated with this change. So there's another reason to resist change. Let's go to the next one. A disruption of cultural traditions and or group relationships. A disruption of cultural traditions and or group relationships. Now think about this. There, there's probably some things that you do uh, in your family that you do maybe on, on teams that you've been on, then classes or whatever, and you just do it on a regular basis as part of the culture. And then all of a sudden, someone comes along and says, we're going to change. Let me give you an example of this. Um, let's say that uh, you live in a household that, uh, that, that celebrates, say, say, Christmas. And I'm certainly not pushing any particular religion or anything like that. I just want to use this as an example. Let's say that uh, in your household you celebrate Christmas, and you always open up your gifts on Christmas morning. But then you end up uh, falling in love with and, you know, maybe getting engaged and married to someone whose tradition was, well, we always open up our Christmas gifts on, on Christmas Eve. You know, to, to you, what, open on Christmas Eve? You're crazy. To your spouse, what, open up Christmas morning? You're crazy. So this disruption of these cultural traditions can also create a huge amount of resistance to change. Let's take a look at another reason for it. personality conflicts and the personalities of change agents. There, there might be a change coming along and you know, you're know you okay with it, but the people associated with it, you can't get along with them for Adam. Think about it, even if you're a really good person, you can get along with virtually everybody. Isn't there somebody that for whatever reason, you can't get along with them. And it's not that you hate them and they hate you and you know they, they did something to you when you're in fifth grade and you did something to them when you're in sixth grade. It's just, you just, you know, it's, it's oil and vinegar. You just don't get along. You have no idea why you don't get along. Well, if you have that conflict with someone, whether there's a reason for it or no reason for it, doesn't that give you resistance to change? Sure it was. And then when it talks about the uh, uh, conflicts with the, uh, the agents of change, Let's again go back to using an outside consultant. And the outside consultant is your agent of change. He or she or that team of them, they're the ones who are moving you to do this thing in a new way. Who the heck are they? Now on top of that, besides the fact outsiders, let's assume that they're abrasive, that you don't get along with them, etc. Doesn't that make it all the more likely that you're going to resist the change? Probably, probably. Let's go to the next reason for resistance to change mentioned by the book. Lack of tact or poor timing. Lack of tact or poor timing. Once again, these could probably be two separate things. You're going through change and somebody doesn't do it the right way. They, 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 you're the type who likes to do things step by step by step and they're jumping all over the place. You like things organized, they're, they're in chaos. Uh, you know, you, all of a sudden, that just the way they're doing it, it's not they're bad people, it's just that, my, you know, my goodness, they, they just don't have any tact. They, 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 they should come to you first and give you an idea this is going to happen, don't hit you over the side of the head with this, etc. So lack of tact can certainly increase resistance to change. How about this concept of timing? All of us have odd schedules, right? Our schedules are packed. 
I got to do this, that, and the other. Today I've got you know five crises. Tomorrow I have one or two. If you want me to bring an idea of change to me, why don't you wait until tomorrow when I only have two crises to handle? Don't bring it to me today when I have five and I'm overwhelmed or whatever. So timing has an awful lot to do with resistance. You can come up with a great idea and a great reason for change, but if it's the wrong time, well, all of a sudden now people are going to resist the change. Let's give another reason, just a couple more left here. The, uh, the next reason, non-reinforcing reward systems. Non-reinforcing reward systems. It, it, it's kind of a, a dry term or whatever, but actually there's a lot of meat to this. It kind of goes to that 85-15 rule or even the, the, the thing with Cotter about 90-10 or 70-30 or whatever. You know, if you're in top, you're in charge of an organization, you're the one who sets up the incentives. And if you have incentives that are in place that actually disincentivize somebody from changing, it's your fault, right? Let me give you a classic example of this. This is a true case. It uh, involves, a, uh, there's, there's an airline called uh, U.S. Air, U.S. Airways. It's an emerger, it has been merged, I think, with American Airlines or something like that. But you probably have heard of U.S. Air, U.S. Airways. That company, uh, initially when it started, was called Allegheny Airlines. And the service on it was so bad that most people, including my family, called it Agony Airlines. And things didn't really necessarily improve because you usually found that with regard to customer surveys, customer surveys for U.S. Air, U.S. Airways, was always, always pretty poor surveys compared to other airlines. And U.S. Air, U.S. Airways, and they went by two different names. They, they changed at one point, and I don't know what they ended up with. Um, they oftentimes were in financial distress. I think they declared bankruptcy once, maybe a couple of times. So one of the things that they, they did is one of, the, one of the top people said, you know, we, we, we've got to change. We can't keep going into bankruptcy. We, we've got to make some changes. What can we do? And they looked at some of the surveys, some of the customer surveys, and one of the big problems that they seemed to have that a lot of customers were upset with was something that probably would upset you too. Customers are upset that they get on a plane and they'd fly to, say, Denver, and their luggage didn't arrive with them. Their luggage was, say, back in, well, I'm in Pittsburgh, back in Pittsburgh, or it got sent to Raleigh, North Carolina, for goodness knows what reason. And, of course, you can imagine how upset you would be. You know, you, let's say that you're flying to, uh, uh, well, let's say, Boston, Massachusetts for a job interview, and on the flight you're just wearing, you know, a T-shirt and jeans or whatever, and you have your suit packed up, and, you know, and it's in, in your luggage. And you get there to go to the job interview, and your suit and the luggage are in Los Angeles, and you're there, and you've got this job interview. What are you going to do? Show up in a T-shirt and jeans or go out and spend a million dollars to buy a suit at the last minute? What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to be upset with the, with the airline for it. So what the airline did, what the top dog says, okay, we, we've got to make some changes here. We've got to make sure that when wherever passengers go, their luggage goes too. It arrives at the same place at the same time as the passengers. So they went to the... Uh, the baggage handlers union and the baggage handlers are the ones who load the plane with all your luggage and whatever and they went to the union and they they said hey we've got this uh, this new uh, strategy here we want to make sure that every time that plane leaves uh, let, let's say that Jane and, uh, 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 and and Tom are on that plane every time that plane leaves see John Jane and Tom up there with you know, on the windows every time that leaves you want to make sure that all the luggage is on that plane before it leaves. We don't want anything leaving back here. Make sure the luggage is on. Because when Jane and Tom get to San Francisco, we want their luggage to be with them at the same time. So the union said, oh, sure, no problem. We'll make sure that we do that. What the heads of U.S. Air forgot is they had an incentive in place already from a prior administration, a prior group of people who were leading U.S. Air, uh, and it said this to the baggage handlers, hey, listen, one of the problems we have here is our, our planes are being delayed. We're, we're not leaving on time. So when they arrive someplace, they're always late. The customers are upset. So they went to the baggage handlers and said, listen, you make sure that those planes leave on time. You, you get all that luggage, etc., on there, but you don't hold out that plane for anything. You make sure the plane leaves on time. And every time a plane leaves on time, we're going to give you a bonus. And I forget the exact amount of the bonus, but it was something like $10 per flight. So you might think, what's $10? Is that going to incentivize me? But if you figure most baggage handlers in the course of a day are handling, 
you know, 50, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, five to 10 flights a day and sometimes more, this is $100 a day that they could be making, $500 a week. That, you know, that, that adds up to some serious money over the course of a year. So they had that in place at the same time that they changed the strategy and said, well, make sure everybody's luggage is on the plane before they leave. Hmm. So now let me give you a scenario. A plane's ready to leave. The baggage handlers are loading everything up, and uh, Tom, uh, let's see, Jane and Tom, or whatever their names are, they're sitting up there and they're watching you load the plane. And you have everything loaded, your baggage handler, but there's still one cart of baggage that has been loaded. And you look at your watch and say, oh, it's time for that plane to leave. Hmm. Now I have two choices. One, I could hold up the plane, it'll be a few minutes late, and I can make sure I load this last cart cart of baggage which has uh, Tom and Jane's luggage on it I can load that up they'll leave maybe you know, at most five minutes late or I can shut the door now push the cart back into into the terminal with their luggage and I can wave and blow kisses to Jane and, and, and uh, Tom as they're leaving and I can get my ten dollars in bonus what do you think most of the baggage handlers were doing absolutely they were keeping the luggage on the ground. They were waving at Jane and Tom as they took off. And, you know, they were opening up their wallet, waiting for the $10 to drop in. So what we had here is we had a reward system that wasn't reinforcing the new strategy of making sure that everybody's luggage is on the plane before it left. So what you want to do is you want to be careful and you want to have reward systems that do reinforce the change. If you don't, resistance to change is going to go up. Let's uh, take a look at the last of the... Uh, reasons given by your textbook for resistance to change, and it's a pretty easy one. And my guess is you folks uh, have, have engaged in it. I know that I have inertia. It's hard to get up off your butt. You're doing it the same way every day. Why change? So, so with with regard to this 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 thing is you know you start thinking of the old saying: if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Hey, things are working out okay. Why should I go through all this change? You know, I've got to learn new things. Oh, my gosh, you know, the stress level is going to go up. But why should I do that? So inertia is another reason you see resistance to change. Well, my guess is all of those different examples of why people resist change will be crossing your desk when you're the manager or the leader of company X and company Y because people are people, and there's lots of reasons to resist change. Well, let's take a look at the, the next topic that I want to take a look at here, and that goes to leadership styles during periods of change. Leadership styles during period of change. Okay, let's take a look at the uh, last topic that we have under change. I want to take a look at leadership and change, leading an organization through change. The, um, the textbook talks about different styles of leadership. It says that when you're leading a team through change, leading a company through change, there are generally are two different styles of leadership that one oftentimes sees during these periods of change. So let's take a look at both styles of leadership. Let's see which one you may be, uh, and then let's talk about which one uh, is, is the best. The, uh, the first of these styles of leadership is called transactional. Transactional leadership, transactional leaders. Someone who's a transactional leader, so a transactional a part of transactional leadership, uh, this person focuses on clarifying employees' roles and tasks. This person focuses on clarifying employees' roles and tasks. Uh, this person uh, will uh, uh, monitor the progress of employees, will be watching them, seeing what they do, will monitor the progress. This person will set the goals, etc., and see how closely to the goals that they, they come to it. Uh, this person also will give both positive and negative uh, feedback based on performance. Uh, and this person oftentimes uses what's called as extrinsic evidence, extrinsic meaning outside. It's extrinsic evidence, uh, and this is such things as, uh, you know, their, their punishments and rewards for doing good or doing bad. Punishments uh, might be, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, just a couple of harsh words are said your way or maybe some sort of, uh, you know, something's put in your files or, you know, maybe you're demoted or you're not given a raise or you're not invited to the company picnic or something like that. With regard to it, again, this, this concept of transactional uh, leadership, transactional management, 
is, is one that you, you see quite a lot of. But the other style you might see too, but perhaps not as much of. And this is called transformational leadership or transformational leaders. Let's take a look at some of the, uh, some of the characteristics of a transformational leader. Uh, this leader will engender trust. Engender trust. Uh, he or she seeks to develop leadership in others. Not only if, if I were the leader, I'm worried about myself, I'm worried about helping to make you a leader. I recognize that in the future of your career will probably put you into a leadership role. I want to help to develop you in that, that regard. Um, also here, uh, a, a transformational leader will exhibit lots of self-sacrifice. A uh, trans transformational leader isn't just going to tell you to do something that's hard and difficult or whatever, but he or she is going to do that as well exhibits a lot of self-sacrifice, takes one for the team, so to speak. Also, these leaders are oftentimes looked up at uh, or upon uh, by, their, by their employees. Uh, they're looked on as, as, as really as, as moral agents. Not that they're trying, not that the leaders are trying to say, hey, I'm the moral person, follow what I'm doing. It's just that their, their, their followers look up to them and say, oh, this is such a great person, you know, I want, want to you know, copy and emulate what, uh, what he or she is doing. And they tend to be, uh, you know, kind of a, a moral guidepost or whatever, uh, a moral compass for, for so many people. Uh, another comp uh, uh, component of this transformational leadership is this type of leader focuses on objectives that transcend uh, the, the immediate objectives, the, the business objectives that are right in front of you, that focuses on broader objectives. Let, let me give you an example of that. Um, again, going back to uh, my, my time coaching uh, uh, youth baseball, a lot of the a uh, lot of the coaches that I saw out there, they were they were really concerned with you know the the mechanics of their players. Oh, so, you know, was your arm in the right slot? Well, you're not the twirling spaghetti, but even more everything. I mean, er, you know, every body part had to be in the exact right place and doing exact thing. They were very, very concerned with regard to the mechanics, and they would, you know, blow a gasket if you know someone screwed up a play or whatever. Uh, they, and if somebody did really good, you know, they, they're applauding them, etc. Whereas other coaches that we ran across, they recognized that you know none of these none of these players are really going to be up on the pros. Uh, you know, a couple might play in college, but. You're not going to find these these kids up there. So maybe there's something more to this. So we certainly want to teach the, 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 the players skills and you want to help them to develop uh, self-confidence and things of that nature. But maybe other things that we should be doing here is indeed something broader like self-confidence, like teaching them character, teaching them how to be uh, you know good men, good women as, as they, they grow up, etc. So they're, they're looking at something broader than did we just win the game. They're looking at something and so far as how did I impact perhaps this, this person's life uh, that we have. I think you just heard my, uh, my, uh, my dog bark there. But now a question I have for you with, with three, oh, and also um, these, these leaders tend to use what's called intrinsic evidence, intrinsic as opposed to extrinsic. They try to develop within people their own motivation to do well. They try to develop loyalty and, and trust uh, with regard to themselves, the organization that they have, uh, they you know a, a desire to do better. They again they, they they find a way to to reward you internally as opposed to externally. So it's more of this intrinsic type of motivation. So a question I have for you as we kind of move towards the closing of this uh, lecture on on change, still focusing on on leadership. If we find transactional and transformational leaders in a lot of change situations. My question for you is, which is the best? In fact, maybe my question to you is, which are you? Are you more transactional than transformational? Or are you more transformational than transactional? Where do we stand there? Now, the question that I ask kind of begs itself and puts itself into an interesting position which one's best. I think most people would generally say, and, and I think that the authors say, that when going through periods of change, generally speaking, the best is a transformational type of leader. They're transforming the organization, they're transforming through change. This is a pretty good type of leader for it. But 
The real answer, again, goes back to what we talked about, like with Theory X and Theory Y. It goes back to Machiavelli. The best manager is not one, or best leader is not one who is transactional or transformational. It's someone who can be transactional when transactional is needed, transformational when transformational is needed. That would be the best type of leader that we have here. Someone who's flexible and can be one or the other and fit the situation that you have. Well, there you have it. We've, we've talked quite a lot about change in organizations. We started off with, you know, what are some of the causes of it? We looked at some of the models. We looked at resistance. Then we finished up with uh, some, some prime leadership types. There are other leadership types as well, but those tend to be the ones that uh, you find in change situations. So hopefully you picked up, again, some more tools for your toolkit, something that will help you to become a, a better leader, a better manager in the future, because let's face it, if you're a leader, if you're a manager, change is going to be there. You can't avoid it. You can't get around it. You can't get away from it. It's going to be there. So how are you going to lead your organization through change? How are you going to manage the change? Well, it's going to be up to a lot of different factors, but hopefully we just gave you a couple more tools for your toolkit to help you be a little bit more successful with it. So now let's go on to another topic in our leadership class.